So here now is your chance uh, to get to meet him and learn more about uh, his documentary and why he made it. Please welcome Jeremiah Kamara. All right, good morning to everyone. Uh, this will be the shortest talk in, that I've ever done. <laughs> Got about 10 minutes here, but we'll make it happen. I'm honored to be here. Uh, thanks to uh, Annie Laurie and, and Dan uh, for inviting me um, to this event, to an organization that's so important, and uh, to not only this country, but to the world. We definitely need Freedom From Religion Foundation. Um, America, you know, it's funny, they say that America is going, going to hell and going wayward because of the rise of secularism. That is the dumbest thing I've ever heard. Um, you know, I've met so many beautiful people here. It is really crazy. And I, I, I just, it makes me laugh because do you realize that once upon a time there was something in this country called slavery and religious belief was the driving justification behind slavery. And now they're saying that uh, we're going to hell because of secularism. But anyway, my film, Holy Hierarchy, The Religious Roots of Racism in America, it attempts to explain how the beliefs in colonial America, how the beliefs in a biased supreme being during colonial America led to beliefs in supreme human beings. When you believe in a supreme being, it's a seamless transition to believe in supreme human beings. And how these beliefs work their way into the legal system. Because racism, there's a legal component always behind racism that we tend to forget. And it ultimately turned racism into an institution. You know, when you believe in a God, you bring your baggage into that belief. You bring your, your beliefs your bigotry, your bias, your superstitions, your stereotypes, um, and your ignorance into that belief. And one of the most fundal beliefs, fundamental beliefs in America since colonial times, and even today, even if it's on a subconscious level, is the belief that there is a God who created whites to be superior and blacks to be inferior. And this was the prevailing precept during colonial times. I tell people, if you don't really understand, who's from Virginia here? Virginia, the state of Virginia, anybody? Virginia, I mean, we moved from Virginia, but many of us still have a Virginia state of mind. Virginia is the boss of this country. You can call it the District of Columbia if you want, that's Virginia. And I tell people, <laughs> If you don't understand early Virginia, you, it'll be challenging understanding racism in this country because Virginia is what, the place where the party started. They perfected racism. Um, sorry about that, but uh, you can't talk about racism uh, without talking about white supremacy. And you can't talk about white supremacy without uh, talking about uh, Christianity. They're tied. I think one of the speakers said it was a circle. They're interwoven. Um, and it's the root of racism. You don't enslave. You don't create systems of, impart of apartheid. You don't create systems of Jim Crow. You don't uh, implement systems of redlining and um, you know, prison industrial complexes for people who you believe are equal to you. But I think one of the least appreciated but most powerful elements that keeps the wheels of Christianity spinning is white biblical imagery and iconography throughout this country and the world. Um, it does three things. It promotes Christianity, it promotes white supremacy, and it ensures and preserves racism. There's a lot of talk about the separation of church and state, but there's also the separation in, of church and the state of one's mind. Imagery is more or just as powerful than any speech than any attorney general or any president or any vice president can give in promoting Christianity. Iconography is one of, if not the most powerful weapon in support of Christianity. It's the unnoticed elephant in the room. Before there was television, there was imagery. 
Before there were magazines, there was white biblical iconography. I remember when I was little, um, my mother had a picture of, of, of a white Jesus in the kitchen. And um, it was sitting on the table. And I noticed I was about maybe six, but I noticed that everywhere I went, the eyes followed me. <laughs> and um, so I knew that this Jesus, there was really something to this religion because I never saw a picture do that, you know, where the eyes actually followed you. So to people of color, especially blacks being the antithesis of white, seeing white biblical imagery uh, causes immeasurable psychological damage, which has helped to you know, lead to severe cases of self-worth and, and um, you know, deep illness of Stockholm syndrome, as we witnessed in the Botham John, Amber Geiger uh, case, and the humongous statue of a white Jesus in the country of Nigeria. And since colonial uh, America, the imagery throughout the land continues to support the notion of white supremacy. We see mythological white biblical imagery every day in the magazine and book sections of Walmart, Kroger, Walgreens, CVS, and all throughout Hobby Lobby. Hobby Lobby is really, I don't know if they have one here, but it is you know, very Eurocentric. Um, we see the iconic biblical imagery in doctor's offices. You remember how we went to the doctor's office, we saw that children's book? Um, we see it in hospitals, airports, um, billboards, especially on I-75, one of the most traveled highways in the country. We see it in schools and of course uh, in churches and movies. You look at some of the big blockbuster movies that we've had and I mean, you know, like The Passion of the Christ, that took in close to $400 million. And blacks go to these movies too, and their, their take on these movies are the same. Um, I always tell people that Jesus is white. Even though he never existed, Jesus is white. And they say, <laughs> they say, why do you think that? He's white because he's white in Walmart. Walmart is the largest retailer in the world. I mean, my phone is packed with imagery that I just collect everywhere you go. I mean, it's, it's all around. And that's something that's really not talked about a lot. Um, so, um, the, the, you know, I, I used to work at a place in Cincinnati. I grew up in Cincinnati. I've been in Atlanta for 24 years. But uh, I was born and raised in Cincinnati. And I used to work at a place called Half Price Books. And I was a buyer there. People would bring their old books in and I would assess them. And I was really the best assessor that they had there. And I was only black, you know, I was working in the store. And so a lady came up uh, with uh, her books and she needed them assessed. And uh, she said, I don't want a black person, you know, touching my books, even though that she was, you know, giving them up anyway. And I was like, okay, no problem. I really, honestly, I wasn't offended. I was cool with it. But what really pissed me off was my white coworker who assessed her books. See, that's the problem. If I couldn't do them, you as my coworker should have said, look, I'm not take your book somewhere else. You know? And so, and, and so, you know, if we're not all offended and all appalled when we go to Walmart, when we go to these places, I don't care. I was at the Miami airport and there's just, there's, white biblical iconography all around. It's all over, it's everywhere, it's, it's, it's ubiquitous. We all should be upset about that. Uh, let's not ignore imagery. Imagery uh, uh, is deeper many times than the, than the spoken word. So, you know, if there's no legal justification to, to um, end the onslaught of white biblical imagery based on the Constitution's protection of, of free speech, then in my opinion, the Constitution is flawed. You should not be able to walk into a store and see white images of Moses and Abraham. I mean, to a person of color, it does immeasurable psychological damage. Immeasurable. There's no way we can put a measure on the damage that it has caused psychologically. Black people don't even embrace their own culture. But what is racism? 
we, we, there's a lot of talk about it. We hear that word all the time, but racism, in my opinion, is the legal backing of a group's prejudices, stereotypes, bigotry, bias, um, and ignorance. It's when all that is backed legally, it becomes racism. And so we've been mentally conditioned to, to perceive an all-knowing and all-powerful creator as a white male. And no matter what our current beliefs are, our memory and association of a white Jesus are permanently, permanently locked in our minds. I've been this way since I was 22 years old, 21 or 22. Uh, I've been out of religion, done with it. But that image when I was six years old is still there. It will always be there. Racism actually stems from one group believing to be of more value and more worth than another group. And it's time to end all of that. And I'm glad that I'm here. I'm, you know, I wish it was more blacks that were here. I wish it was more Hispanics that were here. You know, but it's a, it's a long process, but I think we're headed in the right direction. And you know, my first film is uh, Contradiction, and it's on Amazon Prime. Go to that. And even if you don't watch it, just go to it, because I get royalties from the streaming. <laughs> just let it roll all day. I don't know what's going to happen with this film. Uh, you know, it's the film festival. I was a finalist in the Los Angeles Liftoff Film Festival. And so I don't know what platform it's going to be on. But uh, if you email me, uh, go to jeremiahkamara.com. Give me your email, join. I'll keep in touch, and I'll definitely keep you posted. Thanks for having me. I appreciate you guys. <laughs>